This week on Quadriga, German Unity 25, old worries and new challenges. Reunified Germany is an economic and political powerhouse, but opinion polls show that the two halves of the Republic are not yet truly one. Reunification was a huge challenge to Germany. So is the current massive influx of refugees hoping to stay in the country. On the global stage, Germany continues to attempt a difficult tightrope act, playing a bigger role in international crisis management without reawakening old fears about German dominance. 25 years after reunification, is the country ready to take on the new challenges? Coming to you from Berlin, Quadriga, the international debate. Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. What does Germany stand for 25 years after unification? And is it ready and willing to parlay economic strength into political and international power and leadership? That's what we want to talk about today on Quadriga with three people who follow events here in Germany very closely. It's a pleasure to welcome Alan Posner. He's a German-British author and a regular commentator for the German newspaper Die Welt. He says Germany is still divided politically, economically and mentally. East Germans still do not not see themselves as part of the West. And it's a pleasure to welcome Pascal Thibault. He's the German <laughs> correspondent of Radio France International, and he says most French people have mixed feelings toward unified Germany. There is, at the same time, admiration and animosity. And finally, we're glad to have Inez Pohl back on the show. She will soon cover U.S. politics from Washington for the Deutsche Welle. Previously, she was editor-in-chief of the Berliner Tageszeitung, the Taz. She says, 25 years after reunification, it's time for Germany to stop hiding in the shadows of the past and start taking more responsibility on the global stage, even under difficult circumstances. So, welcome to all of you. Ines Paul, is Germany's current power really a product of unification? Um, yes, I would say so. I mean, it's a product of its um, economical strength, of the wealth and the health of this country. And this has something to do with the reunification. Sure, it uh, made it possible really to make the best out of this country, uh, I think. Uh, therefore, yes, it has something to do with it. Now, it's only 10 years since Germany was being called the sick man of Europe. How sustainable is that current economic strength? Uh, you know, I think that um, was actually necessary. Uh, this state of being sick, the, uh, these big problems, which were an outcome of the reunification, uh, to make Germany as strong as it is now. I think Germany is in a very stable situation politically. Uh, with our leadership, even so the Chancellor is facing some uh, troubles right now, but compared to other Euro European countries, Germany is very stable, also economically, and this has a lot to do with the reforms which were uh, made 10 years ago with the Agenda 2010, what it was named. We'll come back to some of those economic uh, issues in just a moment. Uh, Pascal Thibault, if I look at your opening statement, I suppose that you would agree with one of your countrymen who said uh, before unification happened, I like Germany so much that I'm happy there are two of them, mm -hmm. East and West. Yeah. The German-French tandem, Pascal Thibault, was long viewed as the absolute driving force of Europe. Has that dual leadership, has that cooperation suffered as a result of unification? Uh, yes or no. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, yes, because uh, of course the the role uh, France had before the reunification and before the Cold War uh, came to an end, these role uh, came also to an end. Uh, and uh, because we also have another world with a lot of of regional conflicts, uh, where uh, new um, yeah a new role is necessary for France for Germany. I mean, and in the last years, um, the biggest problem probably. For for the relationship between France and Germany is, um, yeah, the quite, uh, yeah, big different, always bigger differences in the economic situation of France and Germany. Uh, as uh, we have uh, already said, uh, Germany is a quite a stable economic situation and France has uh, to, uh, is confronted to quite a, a lot of economic problems and it also means that on the political scene it's quite difficult to have a, um, yeah, a relationship between two partners on the same level and it 
also explain, I think, the the yeah the animosity some people, especially some politicians uh, in the in the right, uh, in in I think in the <clears throat> in all the parties in France uh, do have uh, with uh, with Germany now, especially with Mrs. Merkel. We are told that uh, during the Greek debt crisis this summer, also in recent weeks uh, in conjunction with the refugee crisis, that some French politicians were very frustrated that they felt Paris was being consulted after the fact by Berlin. Is, is that right, do you think? Yeah, that's true. Uh, also in the French uh, government, there were these reactions, these um, yeah, irritations were also uh, to be, were, could be heard or maybe... Uh, in a discreet way, uh, because uh, like in the in the past, for other decisions, like after Fukushima, when Mrs. Merkel decided to uh, to stop, not uh, uh, not in, in some days, but in the in the in the in the next years, uh, the nuclear plants in uh, Germany. It was also um, yeah a decision without cooperation with uh, the, the Allies. So there were there was in France in the last week at the beginning. Um, yeah, uh, 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 quite a large positive reaction for this great uh, response, Germany, towards the refugees, but also a lot of questions in the, under the politicians and uh, also with negative uh, reactions about this, uh, this decision and, uh, and also some strange reactions. Uh, Germany would only would react on uh, very uh, uh, only uh, to attract uh, the most interesting uh, refugees for his economy to uh, become for the for the for the for the for the future the new slaves of the, the of the German <laughs> economy. Pathetic. It was the reaction. Yeah, some uh, some politicians in France, especially in the left. Uh, uh, in left-wing parties uh, said, and it's quite strange, another politician said, uh, Germany, uh, Germany took our Jews in the past and now they give us uh, Arabs. So uh, some very clear resentments there, certainly in France, for a more against a more powerful Germany that clearly is more willing to act unilaterally than it perhaps was in the past. Alan Posner, the Pre-reunification -re Germany was often criticized for what was called checkbook diplomacy, for standing on the sidelines, for letting others do the hard work uh, when it came to international leadership. Is today's Germany, it may be stronger, may be willing to act more unilaterally, but is it really ready and willing to lead? No. Actually, I don't think Germany should lead, quite frankly. If you're talking about the West, as a whole, the United States should lead. Um, they are the greatest power. They are the power that has the most international reach. And as far uh, and one of the big problems nowadays is the United States is not leading anyone anywhere. Uh, so should Germany jump into the breach? Um, that's not what we do. Um, there, I think the uh, uh, we we need to look to Great Britain and to and to France. Unfortunately, there too we see a lack of leadership. Um, the, the big problem with Germany is, I, I think, is that it hasn't decided really, you know, where it belongs. It's not a question of who we are. It's a question of where we belong. Do we belong firmly in the Western camp or don't we? And this was clear after 9-11. That's why we went to Afghanistan, for instance. This was clear in the Bosnia crisis, which was why we... Uh, were really active helping uh, to resolve that Bosnian crisis. And now it seems unclear in the Ukraine crisis, in the Syrian crisis. We're seeing from the far right, the so-called alternative to Germany, via the CSU, the Bavarian sister party, via Mrs. Merkel, to the Social Democrats, everyone saying we have to talk with Mr. Uh, Putin, uh, we should maybe relax sanctions in Ukraine while he's bombing our allies in Syria. This is the old temptation of Germany to take up the middle ground in Europe. And that is the opposite of leading. Well, this is for me, dear Ellen, um, <laughs> it's a little a bit more complex, I think. Uh, yes, Europe does need Germany as a leader. The United States do need a strong Europe. Barack Obama said he wants to lead from behind. I'm very glad that we do have an American president right now who is not like triggering the bombs as easy as uh, Bush did that before. Um, and Germany, with all its power, 
and its economical wealth and its stability. We have to say that. Look at France and the right-wing parties there. Look at Great Britain and the right-wing parties. They're really threatening a stable political system. So Germany has to take a special role. And I think it's, it's fair enough that we discuss that. It's not so easy for us Germans after all these years uh, where we were told that we aren't allowed to take military responsibility to change this course. And it's good that we discuss this openly. And I'm very very happy that at least in this point the different parties do take different stands because it is necessary in a democracy to discuss these things. Uh, but I have the feeling that with uh, um, uh, Chancellor Merkel, Germany is on this path to be willing to take more responsi responsibility and sorry, Europe needs to take responsibility in these huge uh, conflicts and we can't just wait for the big brother United States to solve all these problems. Now, Alan Posner told us leadership is closely connected with a sense of identity. He asked whether Germany really knows who it is. Let's take a look at German identity 25 years after unification. To what degree do Eastern and Western Germany now truly share common traits? Are they as closely joined as Helmut Kohl promised 25 years ago when he said that unification and hard work would make out of the desolate industrial landscapes of the East blooming landscapes? Let's take a look. Yes, the landscapes are flourishing, but there's not much industry here. Productivity in eastern Germany is 30% lower than in the western part of the country. Yes, there are beautiful lakes in the east. These are the flooded pits of former lignite coal mines. Much of communist East Germany's chemical industry was phased out. At least the air is better now. Eastern German towns have been spruced up, but young people are leaving them to find jobs in the west. Recent surveys show that even after a quarter of a century, many people in the East don't entirely feel like part of the reunited Germany. So far, two trillion euros have been spent to make up for decades of division. German reunification, a costly and still ongoing success story. So DW did its own poll uh, just recently, and it found that a very strong majority of Germans, uh, over 70%, do see unification as a success. And at the same time, two-thirds say the process isn't finished. Alan Posner, would you agree with both of those statements, that it's a success and that the process isn't finished? Um, I'd agree with the second statement. I wouldn't agree with the first. Uh, what, what has happened, you talked about checkbook diplomacy, what has happened is the West has plastered the East with gazillions, literally, uh, uh, of money which is never going to uh, come back. I mean, it's not like loans we gave to Greece. This is just money we've poured into it to make the, the whole thing look nice. Uh, the fact is that what we haven't done is we haven't changed people's mentality. Um, uh, you know, I mean, just think of, of what happens in schools. They're still being taught in the same way they were taught in the German Democratic Republic. In many cases, they're being taught the same things they're being uh, taught in the German De Democratic Republic. There's still an inner aversion to capitalism and, and market economy. There's still no real understanding of democracy. Any time a government decides something that people don't like, you know, they go out and, and say, oh, I wasn't asked. Well, the point is you have to vote. It's still the case that a common ex common this party, like the so-called left party, gets over 25% in the East. It's incredible. You know, I mean, Bertolt Brecht, a communist himself, said only uh, the stupidest calves vote, uh, elect their own butchers. Now, that's what they're doing in the East. And you can't tell me that there's no problem there. Pascal Thibault, you have been covering Germany for most of the 25 years since unification. Would you agree with what you just heard? Are East and West truly that far apart? Do they still utterly lack a common sense of identity? I mean, the question of the German identity, it's, uh, it's probably the question the Germans have uh, or have, um, yeah, I've had for the last, uh, for the last decades or the last centuries, I think. Uh, a great expression for it in French, don't you? La yes. question allemande. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, the Deutsche Frage, uh, the German question. And I think a, a, a good question also could be, uh, yeah, is there a German identity? And, is the, is the reunification process uh, or 
isn't the German reflection uh, process uh, finished, uh, but what does it mean if it's finished or not? Uh, do we need um, and, uh, exactly um, the same... Um, the same developments as uh, we have in other regions. And I mean, we have to, to also to have a look to other differences uh, between uh, German regions, like we have them in uh, other countries. So I think it's one point. I do not absolutely, I do not exactly agree about uh, the economic development because I think the uh, all the East Germans uh, and East Germany itself was also a new and a big market for the West German firms. And some of these firms also profited from the uh, from uh, from these East German who moved to West Germany and who, uh, for some of them, were well educated in the last 25 years. And uh, I think it's uh, it's not a unilateral uh, process we uh, we had in the last uh, 25 years. It's uh, it would be too simple. And a, and a strong left wing party, it's a reality in uh, yeah quite a lot in quite a lot of European countries. Uh, I mean. For German, for Germans, probably it's something strange, probably because of the of the anti-communism in West Germany till 1989 and since then. But I mean, in quite a lot of other countries, have a look to uh, South Europe, it's uh, normality. In a sport, when I go to the east, I see Leipzig, Dresden, absolutely cutting edge infrastructure, beautiful new buildings, impressive new roads. Great universities, wonderful startups. Those, of course, are the big cities. Yeah. The picture in the countryside is somewhat different. 30% less economic strength than in the West, according to our report there. Should the taxpayers have gotten more for their 2 trillion euros that they spent? Well, first of all, there wasn't any alternative. Sure, Germany and the West had to support East Germany, the former GDR. There, there wasn't any alternative. Could, have, could it have been differently? Could it, could it have been done differently? Sure, many mistakes were made. But probably we don't want to go into that too deeply. You know what? I do not like to talk about East and West in that really two simple categories. You also can go to West Germany up to the very north there's hardly any industry as well. You can go to parts of East Germany, as you said, there is a great economical and cultural wealth. So we have to be, you know, I think we have to be a little bit more precise when we talk about different regions. But yes, indeed, in East part, uh, Germany, at the whole, there, the, the econo economical wealth is, is less developed and it will stay like that. We see that. I mean, um, this, this probably will be a problem that, in the, that the industry isn't going there as much as we want uh, it to happen. Alan Posner? All right, the point is not, you know, uh, wealth, industry, uh, money we put in there. The point is how East Germany by its uh, legacy of communism, is changing the whole country. And I think when you have a, a place changing like... Changing the West as well as the well, East. Well, changing, changing the West. I mean, we all know that immigration changes a country. You can talk about that. But um, we've also had this 16 million people coming in, uh, which is m much many more than, than, than we're facing Syrian uh, uh, refugees. And they have changed the country. And, they, and the problem is, we, we, if you have someone from the so-called left party, which are not left party at all, which in fact are communists who aren't true leftists, if you have them governing a state like Thuringia, also they have a say in national politics. And this question that everyone is asking themselves, where does Germany stand? Can we count on Germany when, uh, when to form a united front, for instance, against Putin, to stand with its allies uh, uh, in Syria and so on, where we're not doing anything, by the way? Um, these questions are decided there. And you can't just say, well, everyone else has, a, has, has communist parties too. These are parties uh, that weren't 
you know, governing parties in a communist Pascal, system. What are you but talking Pascal, about? If you, sorry, but if you talk about if you talk about German and the German Parliament, the left, the leftist, the left party doesn't play that big role. You're you're you're, you're uh, talking or you're saying here. It's just not true. We have a, a very strong majority of the of the SPD, the Social Democrats, and the CDU, and they are ruling this country. And they are responsible for the question if we take military action in Syria or not. The left party doesn't play any ro role whatsoever. Sorry, this is just not true. This Pas is just not right. Pascal Thibault, <laughs> uh, you mentioned yourself that many other countries in Europe, including your own, have strong uh, far-right movements, also a lot of xenophobia. Certainly one of the differences that we've seen between East and West is the Willkommenskultur in the West for the new refugees, uh, lots of openness and tolerance, at least so far, whereas in the East there have been some xenophobic attacks and uh, and some very harsh words. Would you say, though, that the situation here in Germany on the whole is any different because of that East-West split than that in many other European countries? I mean, uh, there is one fact that these um, extraordinary scenes with, we saw in the last weeks are uh, especially for, uh, for, uh, for somebody coming from France, quite extraordinary. If you look at the atmosphere in France towards uh, refugees and immigrants, it's uh, incredible. Um, and also in other, in other countries in Europe where you also have right-wing parties, uh, which infected more or less the political debate. And uh, there is a difference that's true between East and West Germany. There also have been some attacks against refugees or against uh, the, the buildings where refugees um, um, are hosted in West Germany. But the polls and the statistics all uh, show that there is uh, that racism, xenophobia is more developed in East Germany. And probably, I think, the past and the lack of... Um, how, do you can, how can you call, call that? The lack of... Um, um, yeah, there is a cultural problem which, uh, which hasn't been uh, solved since the 1989-1990, uh, since the reunification. And uh, one has also probably to do with the fact that uh, these people in the East yeah, usually don't know what foreigners are, and uh, there are a few contacts we, we to can't, foreigners. Uh, the, the polls also see that the the people, especially in West Germany, have less problems with uh, immigrants, with refugees, uh, where there are more immigrants, and uh, I think there are maybe two percent uh, immigrants in the in East Germany today. So it's more or less nothing. I want to come back to the economic questions that we briefly brought up because, of course, it is considered a truism to say that Germany's identity is deeply rooted in its economic prowess. Now, Germans were once said to be more patriotic about their Deutsche Mark than they were about their own flag. So how unshakable is the national brand made in Germany? Reliability Volkswagen. That flagship of German industry manipulated and cheated. Has the scandal damaged the image of German car makers for years to come? Precision. It turned out that Heckler & Koch's G36 service rifle loses accuracy when the barrel gets too hot. That meant the Bundeswehr couldn't shoot straight in hot weather. Punctuality. Berlin's new international airport, scheduled to open in 2010, has turned into a nightmare of construction errors, technical problems and planning mistakes. The delay is now costing 40 million euros a month. So what happened to those German virtues? Ines Paul, there's been a lot of agonizing in the German media that the D VW scandal may forever damage that brand made in Germany. Do you think it will? Well, uh, it, it really will harm uh, this made in Germany brand a lot and the German car industry, which is crucial for the German economical wealth. So yes, there's a lot of damage going on and um, this will be a story which we will follow for many, many more months, maybe years. Thibault, Pascal Thibault, would you agree? Do you think those old German virtues uh, are melting down? If you look at Deutsche Bank, if you look at Volkswagen, are we somehow seeing the fading of, of what we used to consider German character traits? 
Yeah, surely, but I, th I think it's n it's not uh, it's not quite new. I mean, uh, you also had in the in the past some uh, uh, some corruption in Germany or some corruption uh, from a German uh, enterprise in uh, in other in other countries, etc., etc. And some problems are quite new. I think it's it's probably a good it's probably a good uh, evolution if uh, if it's a way for uh, the Germans for the German firms. Uh, to uh, to ask themselves is their model is uh, is the way they developed in the past is uh, still uh, still um, adapted to the to the reality of um, of our time. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us today. Thanks to you out there for joining in. See you soon. <laughs>